Obeisance to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from unreal to the real, to lead us from darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. Today's subject I am speaking, that thou art. It's a very significant topic. If we realize this, then all the problems of our life would be solved. As long as we don't realize what we are, there is no end for our suffering. So, the very fact that you are not enjoying peace shows that you have not realized what you really are. Suffering is because of ignorance. So, the darkness of ignorance must be removed by lighting the lamp of knowledge. To know that thou art is that light of knowledge. It is very important to dwell our mind on this theme. You know, there are many scriptures in the whole world dealing with spiritual ideas. We have Vedas to deal the same subject. They contain the perennial philosophy of Vedanta. So, this philosophy has been indoctrinated by the seers, sages 
rishis through four aphorisms they are called mahavakyas the great statements or commandments each one is supremely great even to think about it gives you immense joy what to speak of realization the first statement is that prajnanam brahma these statements are coming out like flashes the meaning of this first statement prajnanam brahma means consciousness is brahman the second one tatvamasi the subject which we are dealing today the meaning is that thou art the third one i am atma this self is brahman the fourth one is called aham brahmasmi i am brahman these are the four famous statements giving you the wonderful glory of truth spend your life in realizing this truth you will be splendid you won't have to suffer there is no point in simply lamenting over the darkness bring the light of bring the light bring the lamp doctors will go automatically so that means open up your mind get it of all narrowness and all rubbish tendencies occupying the mind not allowing you to remain peacefully remove all those negative tendencies through rigorous spiritual practices then you will be able to find out the most precious gem in your own heart which has been described by these four statements all these refer to the same principle the light that dwells in everyone's heart the first aphorism which i just now said prajnanam brahma consciousness is brahman this famous statement occurs in aitareya upanishad which comes in rigved all the four vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda atharva veda these four vedas have got number of upanishads fountain of knowledge these upanishads keep on showing you the way oh why are you suffering and suffering in this world come this way this is the path of light this is the path of knowledge come on enjoy the bliss so this aphorism makes a general declaration that consciousness is brahman consciousness in an individual is the same consciousness underlying the entire universe the 
That is, consciousness is the common substratum for both microcosm and macrocosm. That all pervading consciousness is a reality. Consciousness in an individual is like space in a pot while the all-pervading consciousness is like total space. Even when you call space differently, you can't really segregate space in the part from the total space. The material of the part cannot divide space into parts. For the sake of convenience, or particular reference, you may give space different names as pot space, room space, open space, etc. But space as such is indivisible. So, space is one homogeneous entity. Part space or whatever other space you call it. And the total all-pervading space are one and the same. That's the beauty. Similarly, you may give consciousness different names with respect to different embodiments. But consciousness remains ever one homogeneous, all-pervading reality. That is what the first aphorism pronounces, Aham Prajnanam Brahma. I am giving you, in nutshell, the brief meaning of these wonderful great statements. The second one, Tattva Masi. This occurs in Chandogya Upanishad that thou art. It comes in Samaved. It is a universal declaration to all mankind that thou art. That refers to the supreme reality. Thou refers to the core of your personality. The supreme self that is enveloped by the five layers of matter in you. The aphorism explains to you that it is your own self that pervades everywhere as reality. Reality is not anything different from your essential being. To take an example, the waters of the ocean evaporate and form clouds. When the water vapor is saturated in the clouds, there is rainfall. Rainwater collects in the valleys of the mountains and flows down into the plains as rivers. Rivers assume their distinct individualities. Nevertheless, they are all water and water alone. Water in river and water in ocean 
is one and the same. Similarly, beings claim individualities of their own, but consciousness in every being is the same as the all pervading consciousness. Your self is infinite reality. That reality thou art. This aphorism is in the form of an advice to a seeker of truth. So, it is called Upadesha Vakya, the statement of advice. The third aphorism, I am Atma Brahma, this comes in Mandukya Upanishad in Atharva Veda. I am means this, Atma means self, this self refers to Atman which activates your body, mind and intellect. The activating principle in you is that Atman. Brahman activates the entire universe. The activating principle in the individual and universe is the same. So, Atman is Brahman. Atman is related to Brahman as a blazing fire is to conflagration. Spirit is fire, conflagration is fire. Both are element fire. In the sense, spark is conflagration. Likewise, the aphorism pronounces the Atman is Brahman. This Atman is Brahman. I am Atma Brahma. This aphorism provides a formula for an aspirant to practice and discover the oneness of Atman and Brahman. Hence it is called Abhyasa Vakya the statement of practice. Then, the last of the four aphorisms, Aham Brahmasmi, comes in Brihadaranika Upanishad in Yajurveda. The aphorism is the ultimate pronouncement of the man of self-realization. Aham means I. Asmi means am. Brahman is God. The self-realized man affirms I am God. There is no more that mischievous ego it goes on uh, assuming different colors. Prior to realization of self, you use first personal singular pronoun I to mean the waker, dreamer or deep sleeper. You believe yourself to be particular person in the waking state of consciousness. As you leave the waking state and enter the dream state of consciousness, you believe yourself to be a totally different person. Again, when you move to this deep sleep, you assume a third personality as deep sleeper. The irony of it is that you use I in all three cases. That means I pervades the three states 
assuming three altogether different personalities. In truth, I is your real self. In these three states, your self is conditioned by your gross, subtle and causal bodies. It is not in its purest form. When you transcend the limitations of your gross, subtle and causal bodies, you expose your pure self. The nascent I that is exposed finally. That pure, unconditioned native I that is God. So where to find God? In your own truth heart. So I am God, I am the all-pervading reality. The aphorism is a declaration of the seeker who gains the ultimate experience of self-realization. Hence it is called Anubhava Vakya, the statement of experience. The great scripture, Bhagavad Gita, the message of Gita given by Lord Krishna expounds the aphorism. The 18 chapters of the Gita can be divided into three sets of six chapters each. The first six chapters deal with the concept of Tvam, meaning Thou. The middle six chapters deal with Tat, that. The last six chapters with Asi, art, that thou art. So the philosophy of Gita speaks of the aphorism that thou art. So to understand the significance of that thou art, you have to go deep into the philosophy of Gita. Such is the potency of these great statements. So, the aphorisms pronounce that there is but one reality beyond the comprehension of your intellect. That reality you are. Realize that. The world what you are seeing, what is appearing before you, every moment, is a mere passing phenomenon. A variety show having no pith or substance. You are now lost in this empty show. All because of ignorance of your own self. Don't grope in the darkness of ignorance anymore. Regain the knowledge of yourself. Instantly you merge with reality beyond the realm of time, space and causation. Then only you will have achieved the final goal of the life. Ordinarily we see that everyone uses the term I to mean one's reincarnated personality. No one employs I to indicate one's eternal self or Atman. It doesn't mean by that. Entire mankind is hypnotized to believe that self is perceiver, feeler, thinker. In such a hypnotic state, it is extremely difficult to drive home the idea that you are veritably God. Nevertheless, the truth persists that you are God. Realize the truth of Vedanta. Declares the Upanishads. Affirm to yourself, I am God, I am that pure 
Atman. The affirmation I am God is not the same as statements I am an American, I am an Italian, I am an engineer, I am tall, I am short, etc. These statements are totally different in nature. The words American, Italian, engineer, tall, short, etc. They qualify the subject. The subject I. They are something other than I. Two separate entities. American, America is one thing and I is another. So are the other words different from I. They are all qualities, they are properties, they are attributes pertaining to I. But when a Vedantin declares I am God, the word God doesn't qualify I. God is not a quality, it is not a property, it is not an attribute. This statement is not of the same sort as I am American, I am an Italian. The statement means I and God are one. I and God are one. It is a subtle concept. You will have to think very carefully. Let us take an analogy of the rope and snake to understand the concept very clearly. In this analogy, a boy mistakes the rope for a snake. He says, the snake is big, black, coiled. He explains, he describes the snake. He is caught up in an illusion. You tell him, oh boy, your snake is a rope. These two statements, the boys and yours, differ fundamentally. The boy's statement is the same as a man saying, I am an American, I am an Italian, etc. I am tall, short. The size, color, position, or qualities, properties, attributes of the snake. But the word rope is not so. Rope is not an attribute of snake. Rope is not separate from snake. Rope is snake. Snake is rope. One and the same. Similarly, when a Vedantin says, I am God, he means, I am God. I am God. Or one. God is not an attribute. God is me. I am God. I am not the body, mind, intellect. I am the real being. I am reality. The hypnosis has overthrown the minds of the people. They believe themselves to be anything other than reality. They consider themselves to be man or woman, big or small, strong or weak, brilliant or dull, etc. No one even suspects oneself to be God. And yet the hard reality is that everyone is God. Everyone is that eternal being. You are God. So Vedanta roars this truth, points out your birthright, bids you cry out boldly, I am God, I am Brahmasmi. You have to assert your reality. But the people of the world, they are so shy, hesitant, they are so fearful, They shudder at the thought of losing their individuality. They don't want to entertain the thought of reality. They would rather cling to this world and suffer. How strange, yet how true. 
you denounce your intrinsic sovereignty and court slavery vedanta appeals to your good sense time and again renounce this abject slavery don't feel shy don't hesitate any more take hold of truth take charge of the eternal kingdom within you be your sovereign self you have then gained all that is to be gained in life there's a famous episode in the old testament moses is said to have fallen into this state of slavery while walking on mount sinai moses saw a serpent he trembled at the sight of it just then he heard a voice the voice said hold that hissing serpent the voice was the voice of god moses hesitated he shuddered at the thought of it then the voice insisted get hold of it then moses had no choice he has to act immediately because the voice was so stern and was so emphatic so moses took a bold step and held the serpent instantly the serpent turned into a staff and that staff worked miracles moses touched a rock with the staff and fresh water gushed forth from it when the israelites were running for safety the red sea stood in their way moses again used his staff no sooner his staff touched the sea the water split and dry land appeared before them thus the israelites passed into safety similarly reality seems terrifying you would keep off from it you would prefer to indulge in the pleasures of your senses you don't want to drop your ego and experience your godhead you are afraid to leave the comforts of the known and plunge into the unknown you are ignorant of the supreme bliss of godhood your ignorance is the cause of your fright vedanta offers you knowledge to overcome ignorance emboldens you to strive strive for your ego and reveal yourself it seems difficult the suggestion sounds awful but you must make it plunge fearlessly get hold of the ego smother your selfishness assert your divinity embrace your godhead within you will become the monarch of all you survey all your worries all your anxieties they all vanish instantly you live in perfect peace and bliss some may think that it is blasphemous to believe themselves to be god what how can we even think like that they may prefer to call themselves simple inefficacious limited creatures it only shows that they are steeped in ignorance they are blind to the, to the truth it is wrong to believe yourself to be so you are being false to yourself when you consider yourself a mortal with name form position status etc you commit sin when you do not proclaim your immortality when you deny your divinity therefore gather up all your energy all your courage and conviction and face reality pronounce your true nature i am brahman i am brahmasmi i am god let us take 
an analogy. One day a man was involved in a serious car accident. His brand new car was completely smashed. He suffered a great loss. The same evening he returned to his home and he arranged a big party. He invited all his friends for a good dinner. All the friends came, they enjoyed the various dishes and they were curious to know why this party was arranged, what was the reason. So they wanted to know about this kind of uh, happy function. The man told them what had happened. The friends were astonished. What? You have lost your car, your car has been smashed and you have lost a lot of money and you are celebrating by this party? The man replied, yes, but do not get me wrong. It was a nasty accident, no doubt. My car was smashed to pieces. But you must know, I was saved. So I am happy at that point. Don't you see that I still am here? Only my vehicle is lost. This episode appears to be ridiculous. You think this man is rather queer. You laugh at his behavior. But then you miss the message he is trying to convey to you. Examine what people are doing all over the world. Everyone is saving one's vehicle at the cost of one's self. Is that not preposterous? Your body, mind and intellect is your vehicle. Atman is your self. You are worried all the time about your vehicle. You are never concerned with your self. You care more for your vehicle than your self. You have lost your self and preserved your body, mind, intellect. What a colossal blunder. And yet you are not aware of it, much less concerned. It's a great wonder that you have forgotten your Godhead. It's a strange oblivion that makes you forget your own self. You must now reverse the process. Don't pamper your body, mind, intellect anymore. Lay the accent on yourself. Assert yourself. Be yourself. You are God already. You have to take some rigorous steps to arrive to experience this truth. Find it is infinite in a way. Vedanta proves you that finite itself is infinite. It sounds absurd. But when you study the finite closely, you find it to be true. Infinite is infinite is infinite. Let us consider the finite entities one by one. Mineral, vegetable, animal and human. Let us examine them, analyze their nature. You will arrive at the same conclusion. Let us take, for example, mineral kingdom. It is matter. Matter is made up of atoms. An atom is so minute, yet it contains enormous power. The atom bombs speak eloquent of that great power. Imagine the power contained in the millions and billions of atoms packed in finite matter. It is infinite. Let us consider the vegetable kingdom. Take a seed. Sow it in the earth. The seed germinates into a plant. 
the plant grows into a tree the tree produces thousands of seeds so these thousands of seeds you get thousands of trees again they produce millions of seeds so the millions of seeds you get quadrillions quintillions of seeds and trees just imagine all these spring from a single seed does this phenomenon end here no it doesn't it goes on ad infinitum there is no end to production of seeds and trees thus you see unending power generating from one simple seed a finite seed has therefore infinite potential infinite potency infinite power infinite is concealed in the finite the vedantin has trained himself to perceive the infinite in the finite that's the idea suppose you take the animal world there too we see how the infinite is being betrayed in the finite a cat produces a little litter of kittens that kittens grow up into cats these cats in turn produce many more litters thus it goes on endlessly countless cats emanate from a single cat the same principle holds good in the human species as well you have the capacity to produce innumerable human beings there is no end to your potentiality finite though you may be you have infinite potency and infinite power there is infinity in the finite this appears true with respect to your past and future but what about your present capacity you feel yourself to be a limited creature as regards your present state but that is not so vedanta says even with respect to your present state you possess that infinite capacity that infinite potency that infinite power how is that let us analyze it let us carefully analyze our daily activities what have you been doing since you woke up this morning list them out you woke up read the newspaper breakfasted drove to office etc etc and you are now reading this literature is it all have you not done anything beyond this perhaps more if you observe carefully you may list a score or more activities after that you say that's all i have not done anything more than what i have enumerated now follow closely you have actually done much much more you don't seem to be aware of them you have executed innumerable activities which you don't mention for example your eyes have become engaged in seeing many objects each time your eyes sees an object the muscles in your eyes are subject to a series of subtle actions before the sight is registered all these activities emanate from you you are responsible for them again your other sense organs ears nose tongue and skin they are all extremely busy with their respective activities they have gone through innumerable actions all these activities are also yours you have produced them similarly your mind has entertained manifold feelings and emotions you have produced each one of them your intellect has conceived numberless thoughts you have produced them all again consider your other activities like respiration and perspiration eating and drinking evacuation and digestion and distribution of food etc countless cells in your body hair on your skin blood in your veins are all functioning they are all functioning through you at this very moment you are producing 
you are pronouncing infinite actions. Remember this. Realize this. What you call as infinite is in truth. Infinite in nature. Infinite in nature. Vedanta wants you to recognize your innate power. You must develop truth in your own self. You are not a finite, limited, miserable creature as you think yourself to be. You are infinite. You are God Almighty. Nothing short of it. That is the truth. Now hold that view at any cost. Don't compromise. Assert yourself. I am all. I am everything. The microcosm and macrocosm are in me. I am infinite. I am God. You have to keep on meditating on these ideas. Constant meditation gives you full awareness of the reality. There are some characteristics of self-development. First distinct sign of spiritual maturity is independence. As you advance spiritually, you become more independent of the world around you. Spiritually retarded, you become dependent upon your body and its perceptions, your mind and its emotions, your intellect and its thoughts. Self, to yourself. You can gain absolute happiness within yourself. You need not slavishly depend upon the world. You can gain perfect master. Communication over the world. Nothing in the world can affect you. You become independent of environment and circumstance. You are then truly spiritual. You may wonder as to how you can remain unaffected by the world. How can you ever be free from the persecutions of your body, mind and intellect? How can you keep a balance of mind in the midst of trials and tribulations of this world? How is it possible to overcome the influence of the world around you? The answer to all these questions lies in the secret of separating yourself from its association with body, mind, intellect. As long as you are attached to your body, mind, intellect, you are tossed and bossed over by the world. So, detach yourself from them. Be yourself. The world remain. The world can never touch you. You will remain immaculate, uncontaminated by the world. When the coconut is raw, the kernel sticks to the shell. Kernel and shell are together. If you break the shell, the kernel also breaks. This is a common experience. But what happens when the coconut dries up? Let the coconut dry up completely. You will notice the kernel separating clear from the shell. Kernel is free. It shakes within the shell like a rattle. Break the shell of the dry coconut, the kernel remains as it is. Kernel does not break. It is unhurt, uninjured. The same is true of yourself. So long as you identify with your body, mind and intellect, you are affected by... When you your body, mind, intellect is affected, you are affected. But when you detach yourself from them, you remain unaffected, unchanged, equanimous, notwithstanding any damage inflicted on them. You gain freedom, liberation, independence. That is the characteristic of a spiritual person. Then, universal love, the love that people claim to possess is far from true love. It is preferential love. Uneven love. A man loves his own children, kith and kin, because they
they cater more to his personal demands physical emotional and intellectual true love is universal even same to one and all love in its purest form can never be concentrated in one form the more you develop such love the more self developed you are universality of love is one of the traits of individual perfection study the life of lord christ his love was uniform it is unabated in the worst of circumstances when he was crucified he maintained the same feeling his love poured, poured out to those who nailed him on the cross he uttered the famous words dripping with affection father forgive them they know not what they do that is universality of love then objectivity it is one of the most striking qualities of the spiritually evolved ones objectivity means maintaining an impersonal attitude in life being objective is opposite of being involved in the affairs of the world learn to look at the world objectively as you would a picture on the wall be a witness an observer to all happenings in this world watch the procession of perceptions emotions and thoughts go by attune to yourself treat your body mind intellect as something other than you the world of objects and beings affect your body mind intellect but it can never touch your real self retire to your own self and look life with tongue in cheek the days objectivity that is spirituality another positive character of spirituality is cheerfulness cheer develops in a person commensurate with his spiritual awakening lord krishna is personification of this wonderful character krishna's entire life was infested with continual trials and tribulations he had to face the greatest oppositions and challenges yet he remained ever full of mirth full of fun and frolic he was a picture of cheerfulness if you study the life of shri ramakrishna how he was always cheerful all the time even when he was intensely suffering from cancer so whenever people would come to him he would speak to them lovingly giving them the wonderful touch of love so the next point is dynamism as you love as you evolve to higher perfection you shed your laziness indolence you become brighter and more active you become dynamic in the real sense of the term so detect your shortcomings rectify them thus unveil your real self self alone thou art know thyself the aphorisms declare that thou art god god who is not something that you gain or lose god who is your essential being at all times if that be so what exactly is the difference between your pre and post realization states before you realized god you are god after you realize god you are god then what is the change brought about by realization is there a change at all yes there is one significant change that is your awareness of godhood no doubt godhood is your perennial being but before realization you are not aware of your godhood whereas after realization you are aware of your godhood that's the difference that's all awareness as long as you are not aware of your godhood status you are always bound to suffer 
there is a story to explain this idea a famous story known to everybody once there lived a king and queen they were blessed with a boy it was a baby it so happened there was a terrible deluge sudden flash of floods all the homes and uh, streets were flooded with water and the king and queen thought we have to take some steps to save the baby because there is no hope otherwise so the baby prince was thoughtfully placed in a floating cradle by the time they did this the gush forth of the water was so heavy even the king and queen were drowned it is a dreadful blow to the people of that state gradually the waters receded the ministers took stock of the situation they found the bodies of the king and the queen but no trace of the baby prince soon they launched a state wide search for the missing prince there was one clue that clue was a big black mole on the baby's left shoulder blade was the only clue of the baby the search went on for several years while a resident took over the administration of the state in that very state there was a beggar for 14 years the beggar was accustomed to beg for alms in the marketplace all the people shop owners they knew, they knew him well some obliged some spurned him some were indifferent towards him and twice he was whisked away by the police and admitted in a beggar home but then he escaped from there continued his begging again a third time when he was do- doing begging the police caught hold of him the beggar pleaded desperately for his freedom but the police were determined this time they took him straight to the uh, administrative office the resident conferred with the ministers they examined the beggar carefully finally they found out there was a big black mole on his left shoulder blade they were all surprised and they were all very happy to declare that he was a missing prince so they crowned him immediately as a king the entire state became very happy to know that the boy took time to realize the full implication of his sudden fortune it was a year before he settled down and established himself on the lawful king of the state as the lawful king of the state having done so one day he disguised himself his old beggar clothes and went into the market begging for alms the shop owners were surprised to see him after long lapse as before some obliged some spurned some were indifferent towards him he returned to the palace now carefully analyze the difference between the two experiences of begging before and after he became the king of the state in both experiences he faced variations fluctuations alternations of the outer world in the first case he was affected by them in the second case he was not he stood well above them he had nothing to do with them external happenings could not touch the periphery of his personality how did this change come about is it because the beggar became the king no that cannot be the reason because he was king before and after his discovery he was actually the king even when he was begging in the first instance so was he when he was begging in the second instance the only difference is that earlier he did not know that he was a king while later he knew himself to be the king so it is the knowledge of his kingship that made him a totally different person a similar phenomenon is your life you are god the kingdom of heaven is within you you are not aware of your kingship at present you know not you are god 
so you suffer the alternations of life fortune and misfortune love and hatred praise and censure and so on manifold variations and fluctuations of this world plague you but the moment you realize yourself you know that you are god almighty none of these external changes affect you anymore you remain ever calm and composed that's the difference therefore no thine own self the self you are that thou art that thou art when you're able to become completely aware of this truth that is the final goal that is what is called moksha liberation moksha means the first letter mo mo means moha kshaya means kshaya moha kshaya that means the illusion is destroyed you are that thank you om sahana bhavatu sahana bhunaktu sah viryam karavale tejasvi navadhi tamastuma vidvishavahai om shanti 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 hari om tat sat may the divine supreme protect all of us may he nourish us all may we all work in harmony with great vigor may our study be illuminating and fruitful may we not hate each other peace 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 be unto all